And I also want to thank you for the invitation. It's my great pleasure to participate in the Arts of Asia lecture series, which I learned has been going strong for half a century. It was really quite unusual. The, as Peter mentioned, the materials that I present today comes from my forthcoming book uh, with a rather mouthful, long title that you can read. Uh, obviously, it's not possible for me to uh, cover all six chapters in a couple of hours. So what I want to do is just to give you the, uh, the general theme and outline uh, of this book. There are two parts in the book title, and let's begin with the uh, second part, which is actually in small print uh, down here. The International Buddhist Art Style of East Asia. Sometimes it is also called the Tang International Style or Tang International Buddhist Art Style. In my book, the International Style primarily refers to the Buddhist figural style in both sculpture and painting. The new Buddhist art idiom was a synthesis in both style and content of fresh influences from India and the existing tradition of Buddhist art in China that had developed since the fifth century. From China, it spread to neighboring cultures and became a shared visual language across East Asia by the first half of the eighth century. Therefore, I used the term East, East, East Asian International Buddhist Art Style. So let's take a look at some of the images. So I have uh, three Buddhist statues uh, from China to Japan and Korea. They are different materials, different size, and yet I think with your eyes you can see the similarity in terms of proportions and the general style, even though the hand gestures are quite different. And here we have two kind of a guardian figures. I'll talk about them a little bit later. You can see the same degree, relatively the same degree of high realism that we associate with the so-called high tang uh, international style, even though the one on the right is actually uh, comes from uh, Japan. Uh, I teach. So one of the, that's as Pat uh, who is here with us, uh, the chair of the department at Berkeley. Uh, I regularly teach a survey of East Asian art. And so every time I have to teach this in Tang international art style. Yet what constituted its international character and how did it come about? I've never found a satisfactory answer. What were the conditions that allowed a particular art style, which all began as a local and regional style, uh, to be adopted as the classic norm that transcended cultural and political boundaries? And who were the purveyors of a set of ideals across geographical and political borders? Learning more about this international style is one of the main objectives of this book. Now we turn to the first part of the book title, Buddhist pilgrim monks as agents of artistic and cultural transmission. Although I, I think some of you might have background in archaeology and anthropology, there are new theories about uh, the agency and social networks of material objects uh, prominently in these fields. But here I focus on the role played by pilgrim monks, an approach that underscores the importance of human agency. We forget that human agents are very important. Religious historians have long recognized the pivotal role played by Buddhist pilgrims and missionaries in the diffusion of the religion. And yet, not enough attention has been paid to their other activities. Far from the perception that Buddhist monks and nuns were primarily interested in doctrinal matters, their biographies and other kinds of um, evidence indicate that from the very beginning, Buddhist clerics were intimately involved in image worship and rituals and in matters related to the production of images and the building of monuments. They are, they are by no means the only agents in the dissemination of art styles and artifacts, 
but their movements and activities provide a convenient and general framework for investigating the period uh, of the study, which is about the mid 7th to the mid 8th century. The book is divided into three parts, each focusing on one prominent monk and related topics. The, the first one is the celebrated translator Xuanzang. Many of you have uh, heard of him. He was also the figure for the later novel, Xiao um, uh, Ji, The Journey to the West, with, with Monk He as the great uh, um, figure uh, in that novel, although it was uh, fictionalized. But he was a real person. And uh, he traveled to India and returned to China in 645 after 16 years of his journey. He traveled on foot, and of course, sometimes he rode on horses. The second one was the Japanese scholar monk Doji. Uh, he traveled to China and stayed there from 702 to 718, altogether, again, also almost 16 years. And the third one is Jian Zhen, uh, better known in Japanese as Gan Jin, the Chinese monk who tried to, on boat, uh, cross the East China Sea to go to Japan. He tried five times and failed five times and finally succeeded on his sixth attempt. All three of them carried with them Buddhist icons and other artifacts on the journeys. In addition to guiding the imperial patrons on doctrinal and other religious matters, they steered them in temple building activities and in the production of Buddhist art and their uses. The travels of the three monks took them from China to India and back, from Japan to China and back, and from China to Japan. Although their travels covered a vast territorial expanse, it is only in a few locales where the most important events occurred. These locales were nodules of the monks' networks of travel and personal contacts. They were also the places where ideals and art prototypes were formulated, transplanted, implemented, and transformed. These special locales uh, included Bodh Gaya and its environs in northern, northeastern India which is a sacred site of Buddhism, the town capitals of Chang'an and Luoyang, and Heijuokyo, or present-day Nara, the capital of the late Nara period in Japan. Chang'an and Luoyang have been ancient capitals of China since the Han Dynasty and were capitals of the Tang Empire. They were truly imperial cities in that they were capitals of vast Chinese empires. So Nara would be located here, and Chang'an and Luoyang uh, in the center. Nara in Japan was the capital for most of the 8th century. Built on the model of Chang'an, Nara served as the seat of an emerging centralized government at a time when Japan was emulating Tang civilization. Nevertheless, we often forget that for a very short period, these three imperial cities had been transformed into religious and political capitals serving Buddhist empires founded on the principles of Buddhist kingship and government, governance. First, Wu Zetian of China founded the Zhou Dynasty, which uh, historians considered an interregnum uh, of the Tang Dynasty. Uh, it was a Buddhist state and she reigned as the only female ruler in Chinese history. However, this Buddhist state was very short-lived, only from 690 to 705. While her sons Zhongzhong Zhong and Rei Zhong continued the course support of Buddhism, the overall patronage of Buddhism and Buddhist art at the Tang capitals substantially declined from the time of Emperor Xuanzong, who favored Taoism over Buddhism. However, Inspired by her example, the Japanese ruler, Shomu Tenno, uh, some historians would not call him em 
emperor because Japan, you know, it was not considered an empire, not in the Chinese sense. So I continued to use the term Shomu Tenno, or you can call him king. Uh, and his daughter, who ruled as Koken Shotoku Tenno, also adopted Buddhism as the state religion. As a result, the experimentation of a Buddhist state in Japan lasted several decades, quite a bit longer than uh, in China. To a lesser extent, the kingdoms of Korea also experimented with the notion of Buddhist kingship. Early discourses on Buddhist kingship have focused on the concept of the Chakravartin, uh, or universal monarch, namely a ruler who rules with righteousness and is a devout Buddhist who supports the organized Buddhist institution. In India, the legendary King Ashoka of the Maurya dynasty, who converted to Buddhism after a very bloody battle, became the model of a Buddhist king. The rhetoric of Buddhist kingship and the Ashoka legend had important influences in Asian history, leading to the founding of Buddhist kingdoms all across Asia, from the Himalayas to Central Asia in the early centuries of the Kaman era, followed by East Asia in the middle centuries of the first millennium, continued in Southeast Asia after the first millennium, and in Tibet as well. I have to mention this because the, um, the interlude in East Asia has often been forgotten by uh, traditional historians, so I think this is an aspect uh, that needs to be uh, talked about. So in this context, the experimentation of a utopian Buddhist state in East Asia represented episodes of a very long tradition of the commingling of religion and politics in the Pan-Asian history of Buddhism. The making of colossal statues of the Buddha is, all, is a visual statement of the cosmic character of the Buddha as a spiritual ruler. And this often conflates with secular kingship. For the first segment uh, of today's talk, I will examine the Buddhist transformation of the town capitals, Chang'an and Luoyang. Bodhgaya will be brought up in the context of uh, Xuanzang's travel. I will also introduce the new image types and practices introduced to China during the latter part of the seventh century. To the southeast of Han Chang'an, planning for a grand formally planned city began during the Shui dynasty that preceded the Tang. When the Tang took power in 618, it completed the building of the city and, remained it, and renamed it Chang'an, City of Everlasting Peace, which was to become the great metropolis of a united empire. So I want to ask how many of you have been to Chang'an? Quite a lot. Uh, the majority of them, I would have to say. Um, as Arthur Wright points out, the planning of Chang'an was built on historical precedents that conformed to traditional political concepts, social hierarchy and ritual tradition, but also included modifications. The city form itself was an expression of Chinese cosmological ideas, especially in the notion of the son of heaven, the emperor, as both a terrestrial ruler and cosmic center, and also the authority, centrality, and socio-political order of imperial rule. With this orderly grid plan oriented to the cardinal directions, the almost square city was enclosed by a wall with 12 outer gates, broad avenues divided the city into rectangular blocks, the Vermilion Bird Avenue, which is right in the center, was about 155 meters wide um, along the north-south axis. The Imperial Palace was situated in the northern center with the emperor's seat facing the south, this most auspicious cardinal direction. Now, many of you uh, noticed that uh, the, um, in uh, East Asian Buddhist temples, the Buddha also faces the south, and that is an, uh, a practice um, 
that indicates the East Asian adaptation of uh, traditional Chinese uh, orientations. Outside of the original city plan, the Daming Palace, which you see in the top right, was added uh, in 634. Immediately south of the Imperial Palace was the Imperial City, uh, this whole section. Uh, this is where the governmental offices were located. The eastern and western markets were prominently placed as centers of the economic life. By the mid-8th century, Chang'an was the largest and most populous city in the world with about two million people in the metropolitan region, half of them living, living within the walled city. In the 7th century, Tang's military expansion into, uh, to the oasis kingdoms of the Tarim Basin to the west and to the Korean peninsula to the east opened up vast networks for traffic and trade. Uh, I, I understand the theme of the lecture series about movement. So here we have the right political conditions which allowed, of, allowed for a lot of uh, movements in both directions for peoples and goods and uh, ideas. Throngs of foreigners came into this uh, cosmopolitan city. They brought with them foreign religions, languages, customs, music, dance, all kinds of merchandise as well as exotic fashions and tastes. With this vitality and cosmopolitan flair, Chang'an regained its status as the eastern terminus of the Silk Road since the Han Dynasty. Chang'an was also a center of learning. The early Tang emperors affirmed the status of Confucianism as the official ideology. This meant an educational curriculum uh, based on the Confucian canon and the implementation of the civil service examination. A state university was established in the capital while there were other educational establishments and academies. I have to mention this because we're talking about the Buddhist transformation of uh, the capitals. Many foreign religions were tolerated. Apart from Confucianism, Taoism and Buddhism were the two principal religions represented, with the two often competing for status and imperial favors. Since Li was the surname of the Tang royal house, um, the same name as the uh, founder of Taoism, Li Er, Tang emperors tended to favor Taoism. In the course of time, many monasteries and nunneries of the two religions multiplied within the city. And on the map, you can see the, the solid dots and the round circles. They indicate Buddhist and Taoist establishments. So you can see how many of them were there. When Xuanzang returned to the capital in 645, there were uh, already a few monasteries existing, mostly built during the preceding Sui Dynasty. The second Tang Emperor, Taizong, he had already consolidated his power and there were, um, uh, however, the warm reception Xuanzang received from his aristocratic patrons augmented a great century of monastery building in Chang'an. I'm talking about roughly uh, from the mid 7th to the mid 8th century. This was a, a one full century when Buddhism continue to uh, flourish and uh, the institutions multiplied. They were constructed with the support of many members of the imperial family and wealthy nobles donating land, property, and other resources. Here I can only mention a few of them. The Ci'an Monastery was dedicated in 648 by Li Zhi, Crown Prince and later Emperor Gao Zhong, in memory of his deceased mother, but he built this also to honor Xuanzang uh, as a place to keep the large number of Buddhist sutras he brought back from India and as a place for him to undertake the translation of these Buddhist texts. In uh, is Dayenta or Large Wild Goose Pagoda was the tallest building in the capital. Even with later restorations, today it still stands at 64 meters tall. A 
Around the pagoda, many clay tablets stamped with images and short texts have been found. We'll discuss them uh, shortly. In 658, Emperor Gaozong built the even grander Ximing Si, which is very famous. It became the main translation center and a magnet for Buddhist intellectuals, both from within China and from abroad. The monastery's fame exceeded far beyond China because of its scholastic and literary tradition. Today, only a very small section has been excavated because the rest of the uh, site has been uh, covered with modern buildings, so they cannot uh, really excavate that. And you can see the beautiful Buddha head actually uh, comes from that site. Empress Wu Zetian, uh, she was the consort of Emperor Gaozong, but later she became the emperor when she founded the uh, Zhou Dynasty. In Chang'an, she built several monasteries. Uh, one of them was called Guangzai Monastery, uh, just south of the Daming Palace, is right over here. Some of the best known sculptures from her time uh, were originally relief carvings uh, found inside this monastery, and I show you uh, two of them. Uh, they uh, decorate the exterior of the so-called Qi Ba Tai, or Tower of Seven Treasures. The Seven Treasures is associated uh, with the symbols of the uh, Universal Monarch, or Chakravartin, so it's very uh, symbolic. And uh, we'll look at some of these again, and, but you will see the introduction of an 11-headed Avalokiteshvara, or 11-headed uh, Guan Yin, which I would also talk about later. In addition, she established the Da Yun monastery, uh, monastery. Now, this is an important state monastery system. She founded it at the time when she founded the Zhou Dynasty. Uh, this is the, the one in the capital is the headquarters of a uh, network of Da Yun monastery, meaning there would be one Da Yun monastery, monastery in each province. Um, However, it was at Luoyang, the eastern capital, that she built the most important monuments, and we'll get to that in a little while. Her son, Zhong Zhong, and, and several other um, members of the imperial family uh, continued to build many uh, monasteries. One of them was the uh, Da Jian Fu Si, the 43-meter-tall Small Wild Goose Pagoda is still a landmark uh, in Chang'an today. There were numerous other monasteries and nunneries lav uh, built, uh, lavishly decorated by famous painters and sculptors of the day. Unfortunately, almost all of them, uh, uh, along with those at Luoyang, have been destroyed and we only have very scarce archeological uh, remains from the sites. Uh, we do, however, have records from contemporary uh, art history texts. Architecturally, the great Buddhist monasteries of Chang'an were among the important landmarks of the city. Towering pagodas could be seen from afar, and visitors ascending to the top could command a panoramic, panoramic vista of the grand city. I remember that when I was a graduate student, I could literally climb to the top of the Da Yan Pagoda. I don't know if you can do that nowadays, but the view from the top of the pagoda is really just magnificent, looking down to the entire uh, Chang'an city. As a foreign religion, Buddhism introduced to Chang'an element to China elements of social and cultural diversity. The sinologist Yang Lansheng for example, he discusses four money-raising institutions that Buddhism introduced to China. Maybe a surprise to you, including the pawn shop, uh, the mutual financing association, auction sale, and the sale of lottery tickets. Uh, <laughs> Buddhism also introduced new forms of festivals and entertainment, philanthropic practices, hospitals, cheap lodgings, and the first public bluffs. They were very modern, isn't it? 
Chang'an City included tree-lined streets and imperial and private gardens. But some of the most famous orchards and flower gardens were located within the compounds of monasteries. For example, we know that Ximing Si cultivated different kinds of plants, including eggplants introduced from the Korean uh, kingdom of Shilla. Chion Monastery was famous for its peonies, uh, so was uh, Xintang Si. And nowadays, Luoyang, of course, is considered the capital for peonies, and you can still see uh, modern um, gardens. In contrast to the hustle and bustle of the eastern and western markets, the tranquility of the monasteries and nunneries provided space for contemplation and repose for practitioners and visitors, and inspirations for many poets and essayists. So they really uh, played a very central role in the uh, civilization of the Tang that we know. The gradual ascendance of Buddhism in the seventh century provided the backdrop to Wu Zetian's founding of a Buddhist state. In addition to the notion of Buddhist kingship and the paradigm of the Chakravartin, the state Buddhism of China was also informed by the Avatamsaka or flower ornament Buddhism, Huayan in Chinese. Based on the Flower Ornament Sutra, the doctrine's vision of an ordered cosmos with Virochana, or the Buddha of Great Illumination, uh, as a supreme omniscient Buddha pre presiding over innumerable universes, each of which is overseen by his own Buddha, was likened to that of a temporal ruler governing a centralized hierarchical state. Spiritual and temporal rulers became identified as one. The Fengxian Monastery at Longmen, uh, with the famous colossal statue of Rairochana, uh, already gave expression to such an idea. Uh, this was completed uh, a few decades before Empress Wu founded the Zhou Dynasty. Now we turn to Luoyang, which Wu Zetian declared Shandu, or the divine capital. Luoyang also had a rich history as an ancient city and served as the eastern capital during the Tang. Strategically located at the confluence of the Luo River, the Yellow River, and the Grand Canal built during the Sui, Luoyang became the center of a broad network of transportation connecting the new economic center in the south with the north as well as the central plains. It was constructed on a grid plan about half the size of Chang'an. Topographically, because um, the city was aligned with Mang Mang uh, to the north and Yi River to the south, and therefore the north-south axis is not right in the center, but to the northwest. And you will see the imperial palace and then the imperial city uh, on this axis in the northwestern corner of the city. Here, uh, Wu Zetian built some of the most significant uh, Buddhist monuments. Um, there was the Celestial Hall, or Tian Tang, uh, which is number two. Uh, right next to it, uh, there's the so-called Da Yi, or Regulator. Uh, some people, people uh, some scholars thought it was a bronze bell, but the uh, Italian scholar Antonino Forte argued that it was a mechanical clock. There was the a very tall bronze column called the axis of the sky located here. In addition, she built the, the whole complex, revived the Han tradition of the Ming Tang, or Bright Hall, which, was, uh, which has very important ceremonial uh, symbolic uh, significance. So, in other words, the, the religio-political complex harmonized both Buddhist and traditional Chinese notions of kingship invested with cosmic symbolism. And so the whole plan is right here. In addition, she also commissioned several Buddhist statues, colossal Buddhist statues, including Varochana, which was talked about, and also Maitreya, the future Buddha. 
uh, and also many uh, monasteries. Unfortunately, none of them have survived. At the height of her rule, her ardent support of Buddhism drew international attention and attracted many foreign monks to come to the Tang capitals. With the decline of Buddhism in India since the 7th century, there was a sense within the Buddhist community that China had now become the center of the Buddhist world. Luoyang also had a number of important monasteries, which, uh, as you can see, the number marked around uh, the map. South of the city, of course, was the um, Longman uh, Cave Temple, which continued to be patronized. Another monastery I mentioned is actually within the imperial uh, palace was the palace chapel. So you can imagine, it's like, um, uh, like having a cha um, um, uh, it, it shows you the direct involvement of the church in court affairs to have the palace chapel right within the imperial palace. Now, how did Buddhism and its theory of kingship transform these imperial cities into Buddhist capitals? In the scheme of Buddhist sovereignty, while the ruler offered patronage and deferred to the clergy, in return, Buddhist institutions provide services that further the interests of the state. The prominent monasteries and nunneries of Chang'an and Luoyang were founded by the elite aristocratic members of the society. The Dayun state monastery system represented the officially sanctioned Buddhist institutions. They functioned as a network of administrative units that paralleled the centralized organization of the state bureaucracy. These private and state-funded great monasteries virtually functioned as governmental religious institutions. The great Buddhist monasteries played a vital role in advancing Buddhism as a state ideology. They were charged with dissemination of the religion and housed repositories of Buddhist texts. They were centers for translation and learning, becoming alternate institutions of education alongside the state ones, which of course was based on the uh, Confucian canon. In addition, uh, there was an office of monastic affairs staffed with monk officials, uh, which oversaw regulations regarding the conducts of um, monks and nuns. In the great monasteries, ceremonies were performed for the well-being of the state, and they became ritual and artistic centers. For the time, when the Buddhist state theory was practiced, these monastery, monasteries were the centers where political, religious, and economic power converged. So I will, um, in, in this segment, I will uh, talk about some of the new images type that were introduced during this, uh, the second half of the seventh century. And after this section, we can take a break, which I am sure you are look, looking forward to. Uh, we'll begin with uh, Xuanzang. The solid line that you see on the map, uh, the dotted line referred to another monk's uh, travel route. The solid line shows Xuanzang traveling from Chang'an Chang somewhere over here, overland, uh, to India all around India and then return also by way of the land route. It took him altogether 16 years. When he returned to China, he came back with 657 volumes of Buddhist texts, 150 pallets of the Buddhist relics, and seven statues of Buddha images made of precious materials and were copies of famous Buddha, Buddhist images in India. This detail from a later pictorial biography shows the procession with the trophy items entering Chang'an. The images he brought back no longer exist, but a group of more humble uh, images, um, the small clay tablets that I just showed you, they were pressed from molds, have been associated with Xuanzang. His biography mentioned uh, that toward the end of his life, he made a vow to dedicate 100 million images, 
100 million. Since the mid 19th century, hundreds and hundreds of small clay tablets have been found around the Dayan Pagoda and some other sites uh, in Xi'an, primarily around Dayan Pagoda, but there were also other sites uh, as well. Since Ci'an Monastery was one of the key sites associated with Xuanzang, the finding of these clay, tab clay tablets confirmed the monks' vow to dedicate, quote unquote, millions of images. Scholars have uh, categorized these clay tablets into several types. One type is called Shanyeni, married clay or good karma clay tablets because the reverse side is stamped with, a, with an inscription. Uh, it can be translated as good karma clay tablet of the great Tang, imprinted with the marvelous physical form of the Buddha that captures his true suchness. There are three types within this group. Another major group is the so-called Indian Buddha image, clay tablet, because the inscription on the verbal self-identified the image as Hindu for Xiang, or Indian Buddha image. There are also various shapes and types of this group. For the time being, I will only uh, focus on the tablets that feature an image of the Buddha in earth-touching gesture in both groups. The earth-touching gesture is a symbolic hand gesture, the right hand touching down, uh, uh, reaching the earth, uh, refers to the, the Buddha calling the earth to witness his victory over Mara, the lord of evil, which is also the instant of his achieving enlightenment. Examples of the, of the Buddha type can be found in early Buddhist narratives uh, from the Gandharan region, or on steles depicting the Buddha's life events uh, from the Gupta period. However, an individual icon uh, displaying this hand gesture without any narrative context became prominent in India only from about the 6th sixth and 7th centuries, coinciding with the emergence of Bodhgaya as a pilgrimage site and the rebuilding of the Mahabodhi temple which included the main statue with this uh, iconography. The Buddha in earth-touching gesture is therefore a specific iconographic type referring to the archetypal Buddha image enshrined at the Mahabodhi temple. Xuanzang had visited this site and included a description in his travel records. As Bodhigaya gained prominence as a pilgrimage center, the statue of the Buddha enshrined at the Mahabodhi temple became a famous icon in the Buddhist world. Later, small clay tablets or miniature stupas from South and Southeast Asia often feature this famous Bodhigaya image. And of course, this would refer to the Maha, uh, Mahabodhi temple uh, that we see on the left. As for the Indian Buddha image clay tablets, before the 7th century, India was referred to China as Tianzhu or Shendu. The use of the term Yindu to refer to India began with Xuanzang. Therefore, we can securely place the Indian Buddha image tablets to after his time. Below the Buddha is the stamped impression of a verse uh, this is a famous verse uh, called the Doct Doctrine of Causation or the Dependent origin Origination Formula. All dhammas arise from a cause. The Tathagata has explained the cause, the cessation of the cause of these dhammas. This the great Shramana or the monk uh, has explained. Uh, by this time, this four-line verse is considered the encapsulation of the entire Buddhist doctrine and therefore it was found repeatedly stamped on images and sometimes inscribed on the statues as well. As for the practice of these uh, small clay tablets or images or stupas, 
sometimes impressed with the verse, not necessarily the one that I just mentioned. Uh, this belongs to a larger phenomenon of uh, clay ceilings on miniature stupas, uh, stamped with the Buddhist creed, which were found around many sacred Buddhist sites uh, throughout the Buddhist world since the second century. By the sixth and seventh century, the dependent origination formula that I just mentioned was recognized as the most important uh, verse. Uh, it was in uh, inscribed onto miniature stupas, tablets, as well and, uh, as on images, small and large. In his records of the Western world, C Yu uh, not the C O G, the monkey story, okay, um, Xuanzang himself wrote, there is a practice in India of making incense powder into paste to make a small stupa five or six inches tall. People write pieces of scripture and place them into the interior of these small stupas. They call these Dhamma Sarira. Dhamma Sarira, or relic of the Buddhist law, implies that the Buddhist word, the Dhamma, is equivalent in, in importance to or can replace the bodily relic. We know that the worship of the Buddha's relic or his ashes was one of the earliest form of uh, Buddhist devotion. The appearance of the Buddha in earth-touching gesture on these clay tablets, along with the de de dependent origination verse, attests to Xuanzang's role in introducing both the new Bodhigaya image and the practice of Dhammasarira to China, or at least to the Tang capital. These new ideas were no doubt further reinforced by other traveling monks, both foreign and Chinese, who came to the capitals. Now we will just uh, finish up uh, quickly. Uh, in terms of figural style, uh, you can see the, um, the figure on the Indian Buddha uh, image clay tablet is slightly shorter and broader uh, than the Mary clay tablets. The more slender figure, which you can also compare with uh, a mural from Dunhuang dating to 642, mid-7th century, they refer to the classic Gopta uh, Buddha from the Sanaf, which had uh, came into China by the end of the 6th century. The Sanaf Buddha, of course, dates to the 5th century. So this is the, the Gopta style is actually the first international Buddhist art style, whereas the Tang one was actually the second international Buddhist art style. So if uh, the Indian Buddha image is a little shorter, they might look a little more similar to the 6th and 7th century Indian sculptures from uh, Bodhigaya, this one with the earth-touching gesture of a Mathura, a kind of a fuller uh, figure. And I argue that this actually is the second wave uh, coming from India from the later period than the uh, early 5th century Gupta period that contributed to a change in Tang Buddhist style. We find many examples. Uh, the, this gilt bronze, really beautiful uh, sculpture at the Metropolitan Museum, and also uh, this relief from uh, the Qi Bao Tai a sculpture dating to the time of Empress Wu, notice the fairly similar proportions. Therefore, uh, what was Indian about this Indian Buddha image? Because to call themselves Indian is to indicate this is foreign, this is not Chinese, right? So what was Indian is that they represent the introduction of a more current sculptural style and iconography from India that supersedes the earlier Tang Buddhist art style derived from the Sanaf prototype. Now, toward the end of the seventh century, the Bodhigaya image, or Buddha in earth touching gesture, was made as large icons. But the peculiar thing is that these images also synthesized with another new iconographic type called the crowned or bejeweled Buddha introduced to China. As a result, we have examples of the bejeweled Buddha in earth-touching gesture. 
notice this Buddha actually wears an armlet, which is part of the uh, ornamentation. Uh, this statue from Longmen actually wears a tall crown. So this is uh, not the pure Bodhigaya image, but it's a hybrid image. I won't be able to go into details today, but can only point out that the crowned and bejeweled Buddha image, um, which was already current in, uh, in Western India and also in Kashmir and the Himalayas, was associated with Buddhist kingship and was probably promoted to the court by foreign monks at a time when Wu Zetian was establishing her Buddhist empire. Nevertheless, the Bodhigaya image was also introduced to Korea, as shown in the magnificent statue in Sokuram. During the time of Wu Zetian, there were also early forms of es esoteric Buddhism that was introduced to China. And along with that, cults of esoteric deities. Most notab notably were several forms of Avalokitesvara or Guan Yin. Uh, now these sometimes are called um, transformed Guan Yin or Bianhua Guan Yin. Um, under the influence of Buddhism, they feature multiple heads and multiple arms. You know, the more heads and more arms you have, the more powerful you are. And so they were worshipped as powerful deities because of their abilities to protect the state particularly. And here we have uh, an, a painted 11-headed Guan Yin from Dunhuang at Longmen. We have a thousand-armed Guan Yin carved uh, in relief. So at this point, I think we're ready to take a 10-minute break. In the second half, we'll move on to Japan.